All right. Before we get started, I'll tell you that this session is brought to you by the National Endowment for the Arts, the West Virginia Department of Arts, Culture, and History, and also the West Virginia Humanities Council. The session is brought to you with great financial support from Davis and Elkins College, and most of all, it's brought by you, the Augusta participants. You guys have been instrumental in getting this whole project off the ground. Emily and I can't thank you enough for your support and your continued support. We are going to endeavor to bring you more programming like this until we can safely gather once again. Our two priorities that guide us through the pandemic is number one, we wanna keep our communities connected and engaged. That's what these Zoom events are, are primarily about. And number two is we wanna keep our teachers teaching and our students learning. And so that's why we've taken this blended approach uh, to the pre-recorded lessons as well as the Zoom events. Uh, with all that said, I'm very excited to get this underway. So I'm gonna pass it over to Brandy Pace. These two join us from, uh, is the Dallas, Texas area, is that correct? The DFW Metroplex, <laughs> as it is called. <laughs> we're glad they're here on a hot, hot Friday afternoon. Thank you guys both for being here. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So um, this is actually kind of a, a part two of something we were able to do last. Dean, was it October, November at the Austin String Band Festival? I think it was November. Yeah, we we were um, we were invited to perform, but invited to do a session, and so we we sat down and we brainstormed, and we were like, you know, what are kind of the things that make us us? And um, you know, we've talked earlier in this week about certain types of conversations surrounding um, repertoire and surrounding race and surrounding like all these all these different things. And um, I know, you know, for a lot of us who are out there gigging the groups aren't full of people who look the same but we're usually not gigging in groups of people that are so different from us in different ways that it <laughs> forces that type of discussion and so like even visually looking at dean and me it's like oh i think there's some things we probably end up talking about and that's something about our pairing that we've we found to be really really valuable um and we don't think the same things all the time of course but um there's a dialogue that I feel like we've been able to have that um, sometimes isn't as easy a dialogue. And it's not just because of the racial factor. It's, you know, I'm a woman and he's a man. I am relatively young and he is older than I am. And that's all I'll say about that. <laughs> you, you don't want to tell him the age difference? <laughs> We, you know, we've got enough of a gap that we, we have some, some really different mindsets and Dean is such an intense history buff. Um, one thing I found really joyful about making music with him is there's always a story and the story is always really, really detailed. And I find there are some things that um, I've had some unfortunate arguments about, not a ton in the community, but just a little bit. And Dean's been like, but this is literally historical fact. It doesn't even make any sense to be having this level of argument. And I've really appreciated it because he's not pandering. He's just saying, you know, just look, look at what actually happened. But um, before we, we get into it too much, um, we, I talked to Dean and he was willing to play and sing a song. And um, I kind of bullied him a little bit because he had a song in mind and I was like, no, I really like this song, play them this song. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm going to let him, I'm going to let him do that. So what I'm going to do because of technology, I'm going to unplug from this and I'm going to plug in something. I'm going to plug in this microphone and then I'm going to make an ass out of myself. Okay. So hold on just a moment. <laughs> So I didn't tell you guys as Dean is, is getting ready. We'll talk about it more, but Dean is really my, my first banjo teacher um, when I picked up the instrument and didn't know anybody in real life who played claw hammer because we have, you know, a significant amount of people who do, who, who can play okay. roles can and play this guy down here. But, can you yeah. hear me? Uh, <laughs> give me a thumbs up. You can hear me. Dean can, we can hear Dean. 
can't hear us when he does this. Yeah. I actually <laughs> can hear you now. You so can? I oh. oh. You can? We figured it out. I was talking so much junk about you, Dean. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so this, is, this resonator guitar is not my first instrument. My primary instrument is a banjo. And um, when we were in Austin, I, um, for one, we were down there twice, and I pulled this out and sang um, an old Civil War song, Rally, uh, the Battle Cry of Freedom, which I think is a very touching song. But I'm gonna do something really different today. I've never done this before. And so you're my guinea pigs. And Brandy's never even seen me do this. I'm going to take the battle cry of freedom and I'm going to merge it with another song. And that's probably sacrilegious in old time circles. So don't tell anybody, okay? But I'm gonna, let's start it off and let's, so I'm playing claw hammer, open chord G, claw hammer, um, banjo tuning on a resonator guitar. Yes, we'll rally around the flag, boys. Rally once again. Shouting the battle cry of freedom. Yes, we'll rally from the hillside. Gather from the plain. Shouting the battle cry of freedom. This land is your land. Let's, oh, let's just try it again. Land is land your land. This land is my land. Okay, I'm back. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, great. We can hear you. All right. Yay. Thank you, Dean. Well, you that was a little rough, I like but I, I tried to do something a little different there. I like the, um, just that resonator, that, that, um, like deepness of the resonator. I really appreciate so um dean i was telling them that you were you were kind of my first banjo teacher i feel like i told this story maybe earlier in the week i can't remember but um i picked up the banjo um in our area we don't have any people who play claw hammer and um dina jennings who we've talked about earlier in the week who i was facebook friends with at the time i still am but we have been facebook friends at that point 
said, hey, there's this guy, Dean, and I have no idea how y'all encountered each other, but she was like, he's down in Dallas. So I reached out to him and told him what I was doing, and he invited me to hang out with, um, with another peer, and he gave me a lesson, and then he was like, hey, our, um, our guitarist and, and vocalist for our string band is transitioning onto other stuff. And, and then I got stuck playing guitar <laughs> for the next two years. <laughs> That's right. I had an, I had an old, when she said that she sang jazz, I knew immediately when well, she sings jazz, she's got a good voice. So, and the fact that, I, but being, I was responsible. I tried to dissuade her from learning the banjo. Let the record work. show that I, I told her, look, there's great instruments out there. There's the tuba, there's a xylophone, there's a <laughs> glockenspiel, there's all fine. You, you don't want to play the banjo, <laughs> but she didn't listen to me. Ah, so what's been really cool is like, we started playing as a trio and at one point we, we transitioned to being, to being a duo. So it kind of forced two things. Um, one, you know, we, we had no more fiddle. So we had to do all songs. We couldn't just do tunes anymore. So right. it opened up um, an opportunity for us to have to discuss a lot more repertoire to figure out how it fit well for us. And then we get to do this cool thing where we just switch instruments on stage. We just, it looks like a novelty, but it's very cool that <laughs> we, you know, I finally practiced enough that we can, we can kind of play with whatever we want. Right. Um, I think a lot of what has, um, Dean, I don't know if you feel this way, has made us able to talk about things is that um, I'm like a little more blunt than the average person, I think. I and like that. And so yeah, am I. I yeah. think so am I. Yeah. And sometimes we get mad and I think we can see one another getting testy and we don't really care and it's fine. <laughs> and then we... You're right. And then we don't talk for a little bit and then we talk about something completely unrelated and then we're just normal again. That's right. Like. We're both, we both are kind of, uh, we both have a little, you know, s stubborn streaks, but I, but what does unite us is our belief, um, you know, our belief in freedom and civil liberties and we, we're both passionate about that. Naturally, um, Brandy sees it from a different lens than I do, but um, you know we're 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 both uh, we both recognize racism. Um, she's probably recognizes it quicker than me, uh, and there's no place for it. And uh, and and that led us to the music and some some songs we won't do some songs we will do but slightly all you know altered mm -hmm. uh, some sometimes we talk about you know if there's a song that someone asked me earlier this week about you know songs for kids versus adults performing and um, I talked about having the agency as the performer and also coming from a more educational context where you're not singing and playing and we have a couple of songs that um, to me are not terribly overt, but because of the roots of the song, it's something we would talk about on stage and talk about together that um, in my elementary music teacher life, I wouldn't, I wouldn't sing and play with kids. And I think um, what, ha what I noticed happening a lot when I first played with Dean with the trio would be like, we play a song and it was new to me. And so I'd look at the lyrics and be like, yo, we can't do that song. And then, <laughs> right. and then Dean would be like, oh yeah, that, that makes sense. I, I kind of get what you're talking about. And it didn't come from a place of like, um, he was very receptive to the idea that like, if I was being welcomed in as a part of the group, that um, that was something worth being considered if the song subject or the text specifically pertain to oppression of black people. He didn't treat it as if, you know, oh my gosh, I love that song. What's wrong with you? Which, you know, we know there, there are spaces where that happens. He um, acknowledged something that to me is really important is that there is such a huge body of beautiful music that if you see something that you feel like 
you know, that's oppressive or causes offense or whatever, it's just not necessary to cling to um, in light of all the, like, just the amazing number of creations that exist out there. Even if it's something that has become ubiquitous or something that has become known as, like, just a, a certain form of standard. You know, that's been my take on it. Yeah, I don't think we have a, a steadfast rule. I think we do it on a case-by-case -case basis. Mm -hmm. And um, I know that sounds vague, and I know that it's not, you know, some people want a definitive answer. We look at a song on a case-by-case on a -case basis. There was a song we were doing um, that I had no idea until uh, Brandy told me that it had menstrual roots. I'm talking about Kitty Clyde. Mm -hmm. I had no idea Kitty mm -hmm. Clyde had menstrual roots. Um, but it does, and we perform it. And, and we I talk don't. about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, But then there are certain songs that, you, you know, we're just not going to do. <laughs> and uh, and I also think, you know, from, from an agency and a cultural and, you know, who it refers to standpoint, I feel like me as a black woman saying, I'm comfortable talking about this song and what it means and why we choose to perform it in this context anyway, than having people who don't have that connection to that being like, I'm just going to do it. You know, it, it hits very differently. Right. And we've even talked about, um, you know, we morph over time. Dean and I, I learn and talk about history over time. Um, we used to do more Stephen Foster stuff. And I've had to talk to Dean and say, you know, um, I kind of had an idea about Stephen Foster background, but as I've learned more, um, this is how this is shaping for me. And yeah. um, we're able to acknowledge, oh, maybe this is a lovely piece of work or whatever. But if I say, you know, for me, it's um, something else outweighs that. Um, he's he's been really open because we're not we're not talking about wiping out full set lists. We're just talking about, you know, like like you said, Dean, just taking taking stuff as it, as we go. I never want to do anything <laughs> that makes my partner, musical partner, uncomfortable. So I'm going to defer to her out of respect to her. Um, we will talk things through, but in the end. I don't want her to be uncomfortable. I, I care about her. She's my friend. And uh, it would be ridiculous of me, inconsiderate of me, to, to, treat, to treat her otherwise. So there's plenty of body of, we, we're, we're, there's plenty of music out there, old time music out there, that waiting for us to discover and play together. There's tons of stuff out there for us yeah. to do. And so um, Stella asked a question. Um, she said, what are some songs that we won't do? And it kind of, something I was gonna respond to what you were saying with Dean, fits into this question. So for example, we don't do Yellow Rose of Texas. Right. Um, we, we don't do the Stephen Foster anymore and it has more to do with um, the context of his work rather than each individual song and um how that has been represented and again we're we're just talking you guys through what we do we're not saying every single thing we do must be the exact way you do it but here are things that have been important to us as we work together and um there's a a concept of positionality so it, it's basically what the things that are part of your identity and how they affect how you walk through the world and how you see things so for example for me my positionality is i'm a black woman I'm a black American, I'm a descendant of enslaved people, I'm a music teacher, I'm a musician, I'm a middle class person, like all these different little identity points. And because I have those, they affect what I perceive as most important, the, the way that I look at things. So um, Stella was talking about um, playing songs where you don't think about the possibility of the offense. It's a positionality thing. So like I saw Yellow Rose of Texas and um, I saw that D word and was like, oh, heck no. But somebody else who, who doesn't have the same positionality as me and is thinking about history and is thinking about 
what they might call authentic, authentic or whatever it is. You know, the positionality is just different. And so um, it might take someone saying, hey, this is super de duper offensive. And um, it's like, you know, Dean, Dean said for me, um, you, you kind of have to defer to, to if you, if you are creating harm, you know, and Dean doesn't try to make the issue that I feel harmed. He just acknowledges what to me is a concern. And, you know, we've had, we've had some discussions just like sitting like with, with other people, not just the two of us where, um, you know, the person was like, from their point of positionality, they wanted to speak to something about black oppression in the States. And Dean was like, no, 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 literally during history, this legal thing happened, this, you know, historical thing happened. And, um, you know, like this is the actual thing. So anyway, yeah, I hope, st st <laughs> I, hope I didn't meander too much, but um, those, are, those are a couple of examples. Um, and I'm trying to think, it's been a long time since Dean and I have had to specifically say no to things because we've kind of got our set, our set together. But um, I remember Yellow Rose of Texas, I think, was like the, yeah. the first one where I was like, uh, nah. Um, and I so, remember I was at your house. <laughs> you got, I will remember uh, I was at your house and there was a line about, and it was, it was actually a different iteration of the song uh -huh. um, because the song actually goes back before the Civil War, but it's um, I'm a I'm a rebel soldier far from my home. And you looked at me like, hell no, but actually that's just one version of the song. The song's older than the Civil War, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. but I I sang that lyric, I'm a rebel soldier far from my home. And Brandy, well, we she got gave, mad at each other, didn't we? I didn't get, <laughs> no, I didn't get, no, I didn't get mad at you. I think you were a little perturbed at me. I think you, I think you were mad because of my attitude. <laughs> I don't get, I don't I, get mad at I had, you. Because I had an attitude. <laughs> I don't get mad at you. Um, but, you know, here's the, I guess the bottom line is that Brandy and I can talk. Yeah. And a lot of, a lot of people, a lot of white folks and black folks won't talk about this stuff, right? So we talk about it. And, and that's, I guess, if there's one message I have for you all, it's that, um, I think that we should talk to people that don't look like us, that don't are not of our age group. You know, when we take the stage, I joke that we're a, a father and daughter team and a father and daughter duo. And people look and they chuckle and, you know, we try to bring a lightness to it because we are, a, we know that we are a curiosity. But we're also friends, and we respect each other, and we talk things through. And I think that's about the most important thing I can pass on to you folks. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm looking in the chat just to make sure. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Says we're lucky. Oh, you guys can see the chat. This is not private. I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so it, it does help. Sometimes you can Google and Google racism, racist minstrelsy next to it. Um, personally, some places that pop up really, really quickly for me, Library of Congress pops up really, really easily. And I've gotten used to doing the kind of digging that will um, allow me to find more than one source for something. And something I spoke to earlier this week is um, sometimes it's not that the origin is an issue. It's that the reason it's popular at all is the issue. So, um, you know, people talk about Turkey and the Straw. That's a really good example. We know that that tune goes way, 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 way back. back. But if we look at the reason that it's widespread in the U.S., um, it has ties to things that are an issue. So sometimes it's not even necessarily the, you know, the, the background of the song. So, you know, 
once once that happens though, once it gets linked that way and once it gets spread that way, it's not something that we can pretend to separate any longer. And it's not something that we can skip over and say, you know, oh, I'm just I'm just giving you guys the original form. There's not a problem with it. Why do you have an issue with it? And it's because the only reason it's it's been, you know, propagated enough for us to be familiar with it in the first place is the the very reason that we might have an issue with whatever the particular tune or song is. And um, uh, if it matters, we, we are speaking very specifically to songs at this point because we don't do tunes. We, we, we don't have an instrument that, that we play melody on for real. So we are, we are singing and... Um, well, you're like, singing, I'm, I'm croaking. You're singing. <laughs> usually I'm singing, I'm singing harmony with, with Dean. I, I, sing, I sing a few lead things now, but I think because of the way we transition so, and it really affects our key choice now is um, the fact that it needs to be something I can harmonize with or if it's something I sing lead in, you know, it can't be in G anymore because it's super low, all that kind of stuff we have to think about. I should have I sang the Battle Cry of Freedom in F. I was singing oh, it in goodness. G. Oh, you did have it tuned down in F. We talked about that, didn't we, last time? Yeah, I should have uh, had it in F, but I sang it in G today. It was a little too high for me. I still liked it. So I, I kind of want to ask you guys, um, those of you who are playing in groups and ensembles, is there anything that you might have noticed depending on, on your positionality? Um, you know, it might be, you know, Dean, Dean's a white man, so... If, if he played in an ensemble full of all white men, he, he might say, hey, our positionality is similar. So this is something we might not be noticing. Do any of you guys have anything like that you, you observe in your, in your jams or your ensembles or anything that, that sticks out to you just kind of based on looking at what we end up having to talk about? I, I'll tell you what I'm gonna do, Brandy. I'm gonna allow the participants to unmute themselves. I like that. So now um, we can ask in, um, Ask things out loud, not just in the chat. Just yeah, yeah. Good. But if you have something to say, go ahead and unmute yourself. And, and Stephanie, do you want to do you want to unmute and talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, yeah, I I moved to Virginia from the West <coughs> Coast, and the West Coast is a little different uh, culturally than mm -hmm. than Virginia. And I play with a bluegrass group because I've never played bluegrass, bluegrass and I thought it'd be fun. Yeah. But they're definitely all uh, strong Republicans, and uh, <laughs> I'm not. And bluegrass so, typically is. Yeah, and so, um, so sometimes they, they, like they, there's a song that says, uh, my dog's a Democrat. Mm. And, um, and, and, you know, I, I, and and it's always a question of do you say something or do you let well, it go? Well, that's just wrong because everybody knows that cats are Democrats. I mean, that's just wrong. <laughs> well, you know, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> so, and the other thing, it's interesting, um, you know, I'm very white and um, I have that uh, Irish background, Scott background, Dane, mm -hmm. but, but I... Um, my children are all um, darker than I am. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my, I have two kids that are, um, have Native American and so they come with a, a natural tan. They look like they're Middle Eastern is what they look like. And the other two, my stepchildren are um, half Filipino. Mm -hmm. So when you get my family pictures on my desk, I was a human resources dean at a college and I had the pictures of all my family on the desk and it was interesting because some people would come in and they'd look at the pictures and they'd say well who are those people they'd assume they couldn't be could be and, connected and to I'm you going, well those people are my family right right you know? and so it's interesting and and musically with the bluegrass group it's really interesting to, um, you know, my choices of songs and theirs don't necessarily match. So I'm real aware of 
of them, but I don't think they're aware of me. I'm yeah. going to make a comment that's whenever you make a general statement, you can poke holes in it, right? You just can. But generally speaking, bluegrass is more working class whites, more, you know, a lot of, and generally, and this is a lot of old time, except for the old, old time. <laughs> but today's people that are playing old time tend to be more educated and liberal. Uh, that's a that's a broad statement that you can poke holes in, but uh, I understand what you say. A lot of bluegrass folks come from really conservative, <laughs> white conservative working class backgrounds. You know, just in their views, these sometimes these people don't want to put on masks. Some people sometimes these folks just have real strong views on a variety of, of things. And I think and I think beyond the music, like um, beyond being um, general about any particular group, um, I like to talk about, you know, who, who we're dealing with. So, um, you know, you, you spoke more to like the culture where you are in that particular group. And I think it's really good to focus on that and kind of narrow it down. And um, it's interesting you made a point about, you know, do I speak up or not? And um, part of that positionality is um, different identity points have um, have different power. Right. Sometimes it's more fixed um, systemically, and sometimes it just depends on where you are. So it could be if you just happen to be outnumbered in that particular setting. And so there's there's even that kind of stuff to to figure out too. Is like you know. It's going to affect your how you feel. You can speak up. And for me, it's always a balance of um, what's the risk of speaking up compared to what I feel like um, might be harmful if I don't speak up. And it, it just it depends on the balance. One thing that I think is really important is um, not to there. There's no guilt to be had when you feel like, oh, I don't feel comfortable speaking up, but we do have accountability to try to make sure that people aren't alone if um, if there's something that needs to be said so that um, rather, you know, rather than anybody feeling, feeling a guilt thing, just, you know, be mindful of ways to support who, who you see in a space who might not um, be in the dominant group in that space. There might be an off power dynamic and they might know that if you say something, that they're not going to be the only one who says something. And um, that's happened with, with Dean and me before, is, um, you know, I'm sitting in a room, just me and a bunch of white men, all about the same age. And for me, I thought it was worth the risk, but, um, like, he would be comfortable saying something, too. And um, it, it made me feel like every time I was in that setting, it was okay for me personally to say something. But if, you know, somebody came in and sat beside me and was like, oh, I'm not touching that. Um, that's, you know, another black person was like, I just I, I just got to play. I can't deal with this. I wouldn't fault them for it. But um, we kind of have to look at based on on the on the group, like who's at the top of the power, power dynamic in that one situation and perhaps systemically. Um, and I do. Yeah. Th yeah. Thanks, Joe Base. I do like to um, keep more focus. We know things work systemically. And we know that there are like actual statistics about, you know, the dynamics of whatever group. But I, I, I do want to kind of keep the focus on what you guys are each experiencing in your individual things that don't necessarily mean the group. They might or they might not, but yeah. One thing that I really <coughs> struck me watching the Ken Burns series on country music, the PBS series, is that country music, really American music, is a gumbo. It, 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 it's an old time music and especially, but they used to call, they used to call old time music country music, hillbilly music. It's, it has roots, not just in Europe, but it has roots in Africa. It's a, it's a gumbo. It's, and when, mus when musicians don't recognize that, that's very telling. When they refuse to recognize, um, when they believe that 
Old time music is Celtic in origin. Well, that's just a part of the story. That's not the whole story at all. And that's the wonderful thing about American music is it is multicultural. And frankly, I think that's the reason why American music has been popular all over the world uh, to this day. Um, American music resonates, but I, I don't, but I really do believe um, that, well, you go back to the 1920s and 1930s, black string bands and white string bands were playing a lot of the same tunes. You know, they really were. Uh, they were playing separate from each other, but they were playing the same tunes. And a lot of these tunes had uh, African-American origins. Yeah, I'm trying to keep up with the chat too because there's some cool stuff going on in the chat. So I feel I think we lost somebody and I think we lost them off of a point that's actually a really important one. Um, someone said it was too political for them. I don't know if they're still here. Um, that That's very interesting. So that's something that um, I hear frequently is um, people want to say, you know, it's music, it's not political, there's a separation. And actually, like everything about <laughs> everything about it is political, not in the sense of like, not necessarily like who are we voting for or not voting for, but just literally, literally political. And um, you're either talking about it or not, but it doesn't make it not exist. Um, you obviously have free will to choose your level of engagement. But um, yeah. For there me, are some it's really people. important. Yeah, it's important to say like, oh, it's political and I'm not engaging is different from saying like it's not. It's not at all. Um, I don't know how many of you guys um, were here at the beginning of the week to hear from from Jake Blunt, um, who's an amazing, amazing, super knowledgeable musician. But um, he I, I run an organization and he did he granted me an interview and we kind of talked about that a little bit is it, it's like when people say, you know, I don't want to be political there it doesn't go away they're just you know choosing <laughs> choosing not to acknowledge you know I'm a, I'm a music teacher every single thing about how the educational system is built is completely political down to why the curriculum books i have are even in there or what's included in the texas edition which is a really big deal texas is so huge that when the company decides what they put in texas they sell the same thing to several other states because they don't want to reprint the books and so there are just all these things that um i mean they're there it's just you know what what level of engagement do you personally choose choose to have in it and sometimes that might be acknowledging it's there and um maybe you want to dig in maybe you don't but just don't pretend like it's not there and wait a minute i lost it um mike said oh if i don't say something who am i leaving that word to and that's that that's really important with that with that speak answering the should i speak up question um we we kind of have to think we kind of have to think power dynamic wise who um who is left so for example you know something i've heard but I haven't dug into much yet is um is the murder ballots the like i i killed my woman and that kind of stuff like some pretty violent stuff oh and yeah i've heard from people talk more about i've heard people talk more about um the feelings that invokes and so um but also the feelings that that invokes tend to be invoked in um women femmes people who do not identify not who don't identify people who are not men um and so we tend to be outnumbered in those settings and so maybe listening to something that that would have that effect and and not feeling the support of having someone around speak to that you know it's just for me that's important and i do want to say um oh no did i type in the chat and type privately no 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 i wasn't typing sorry kate i wasn't i was reading the chat but i wasn't um i wasn't res responding to everybody um i can't um answer every single tune um i think sometimes we tend to go too narrow and say oh i see your point how about this how about this how about this um and it really is a matter of looking into each tune and and having dialogue with people so like um colored aristocracy actually if you have um you guys have access to 
was it Joe's session where he talks about that too, just a little bit? I believe he he brings up um, how he feels about performance of that too. I mean, he's a he's a white man, but like he the the subject of his of his session, I think is important. That speaks to that for just a sec. That would answer that question more for you because I know the tune, but I don't know about the tune. I just know the tune. Don't know one black rat. I have no idea where that one comes from. Um, and I don't think somebody should ask. The question was. Hey, can I play this song? Well, sure you can. Sure, you can play it. What? Uh, <laughs> you can play it, and if you get push, if if you get pushback um, from an audience member, you ought to be able to have, you ought to at least know something about the song or the tune, so that you can have a conversation. Uh, oh, I'm so sorry, Emily. That's the question I missed because it went too far. So Emily was asking about Kitty Clyde. What we told you about what we consider him playing Kitty Clyde is exactly what we would say on stage. We would say all that same stuff. And then we would say, and now we're, we're performing the song, except, you know, like we wouldn't take, what time is it? We wouldn't take 15 minutes to tell them. <laughs> I would say curious, we... Uh, sorry, I just yeah, thought yeah. I was second. I was just how deeply you delve into like giving a history of minstrelsy in the u.s or if mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. sort of leave it with like this is something that you should look into more audience yeah kind it of. is kind of like giving them giving them like a little taste and saying you know i i might say something like black blackface minstrelsy was america's first popular music it was based on da 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 and it created a lot of the songs that have made their way into elementary room you know, our... It was America's first rock and roll. It was America's first popular music. Mm -hmm. And it's really complicated. Believe it or not, <laughs> it's crazy, but they actually had black performers blackening their face. It, it's, it's, and I and talk it, about that too. It was the yeah. first, it was the first professional music gig. It was. That, you know, formerly enslaved black people consistently had in, in popular music. So there's all kinds of stuff in there. But about the time that we took to explain it is probably what we would do on stage. And sometimes we're, we're at places where um, we're able to dig in just a little bit more. But that's sometimes about... they just want to drink beer and just they don't want to hear it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or But they don't complain. So they just no, they don't complain. The song starts. <laughs> that's right. Um, Heidi says, sometimes it matters how you speak up, whether it be a listening for your words, does it matter? Mm -hmm. For me, um, I think more about like when I leave, if I didn't say anything, how will I feel? You know, Cause, because everything will impact everybody. Um, and this, oh, I wanted to not skip this too. So to the people who are asking me songs that specifically have to do with black people, we are not widely spread in the community, but there are you know, a significant number of us, um, you know, talk to us because what I find in Music Ed, I'm only speaking for Music Ed right now, is um, there'll be kind of a hot topic of a genre or song or whatever. And then the, the person comes to like one single black person and goes, essentially, do I have permission to do this one thing? And then when they do it and another black person doesn't like it, they say, well, this black person told me I have permission to do that. Yeah. And we can't function like that in the community, y'all. No. Like, y'all are going to have to talk to a bunch of us. Talk to a bunch of black folks, talk to a bunch of women, talk to a bunch of non-binary people, talk to a bunch of LGBTQ. Like, you got to talk to a bunch of us. We just, you know, it's, um, we can't, we can't be tokenized in that way because then nobody really learns. We just kind of, like, get by for the next song. And we're, you know, our community runs deeper than that. So you have some responsibility to look into a song to do a little research on a song you have you have some responsibility there um and, and you know we're we're being more you know this it's more community based as a music teacher i'm like you have no reason at all you better look into stuff because you looked into bop so it's not okay to not do that with the other stuff um when you're playing more in a community we're we know we're more likely to encounter people who didn't look um look up a song but um you know it's like if you're not doing that and that's not your thing then when somebody else does it and lets you know here's the real deal behind the song 
then you should you should open your ears to that and be like you know maybe i'll go check for myself so i don't go just off of what the person said but you know it's like now it, it's time to do something because you're going to be in a, a bunch of jams where people aren't talking about where the song came from um but you know i i have black peers who are in a jam turkey and the straw comes up and they're like no nah, sorry nope and then you have to go learn something after that is is my take on it <laughs> i was i was uh, at a i was at a this was in virginia at an old time festival in virginia probably 10 20 years ago and i was in a jam group and they were playing the bonnie blue flag and i was thinking hey it doesn't sound very good <laughs> not a very good tune for for it but i thought wow that's pretty weird that they were doing that we would never do the bonnie blue flag yeah and some things it's like They've been retread so much. Please don't do that. Just like, just don't play Dixie, y'all. Like, y'all don't have to play Dixie. Don't do that. It's, you know, come on. Right, because we're, we're of not, what? We're kind of at that point. But you know, some people do historical presentations that include Dixie as part of the particular presentation. And that's a totally different thing than me walking up to a jam and people are playing Dixie. It's totally different. Um, Rachel made a point about, um, doing research and asking for emotional labor. Some of you who may, might not be aware of that concept is um, emotional labor is, is more like all the extra processing and feeling that you have to do. Y'all might hear us talk about, you know, in your, in your super standard household, you might have like one person who, you know, is paying the bills and going out and working and the other person's like, I have to organize everybody's life. Everybody has to get here at this time and they have to do this and they have to take a bath. And that's that kind of labor that um, doesn't feel physical and might not like you might not be paid for it, but it's a lot of work. And so when we're in these settings and we're putting the, the onus on somebody else to figure out certain things for us, that's the type of emotional labor that people are subjected to. And there's different types depending on the setting. So, for example, um, someone says something super offensive that has to do with blackness. And maybe for me, it's it's really triggering. Maybe for me, it, it, it feels really traumatic. And then they say, well, you gotta explain to me why this is a problem. They're not gonna look it up. I have to teach them. That's that extra emotional labor. And depending on what it is in the setting, it can be exhausting. Yeah. It could be like, do really? Do I have to explain this shit to you? Excuse mm -hmm. the French. Dean, notice Dean's the one with the curse words. I haven't cursed yet. That's Dean. You, you do? <laughs> you drink? You do? you just been, that's the first time I've. So let's talk about something regional. I don't know about gigging where y'all are. So I'm in Fort Worth. Dean's in Dallas. Um, we're about 30 minutes apart. And there's not a big old time scene here. But um, this, we tend to get hired for brewery gigs. And that makes up the majority of our gigs. And so I hated beer. <laughs> And then all of a sudden, I, like this switch flipped, and I don't drink all the beer, but now I drink beer. And so since then, Dean's been like, I've corrupted you. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm the guilty party. I'm the guilty party. I got her to drink beer. And now she's a And now I bring like beer fish. into my own home of my really? own accord, not just free beer from the gigs. <laughs> I, I, I met this school marm, and I've totally corrupted her. School marm. Oh, my God. <laughs> so um, thank you for saying that, Joe Bass. It's a privilege to ignore these issues, especially if you're not oppressed. And we hear the word privilege a lot, but I don't think we really talk about the fact that there are so many kinds. When we say privilege, we think of economic privilege, which is very real, because class is a, just a really, a really big deal in our society and all around the world. But then we have other things. Um, Here's a really good example of, of privilege in a way you might not think about it. So I have three kids, they're um, 17 and 12. And, um, you know, we like to watch family shows and stuff like that. Um, and what is really cool for my kids is when they watch a show and a kid kind of looks like them a little bit. And they're like, oh, that's cool. I can see myself in the character. But it's actually really uncommon to have um, kids shows with black leads. 
So um, I have to hunt a lot and a lot of what we end up watching ends up being from the 90s and early 2000s when there was like a certain time when networks were producing stuff that was that, you know, not only had leads that look a little bit like my kids, but were also um, child friendly because now a lot of the stuff we see is really, really mature. Um, white children, depending on um, the parts of their identity, tend to physically see faces that are more representative just in a broad sense, it's how their face looks. And um, there's like a relation there for kids, you know, it's not, it's studied and then you can just like hear kids talk about it. So um, that's somebody else's privilege, whereas I've got to like hunt for DVDs and YouTube videos of old 90s shows, just so my kids can be like, oh, that child who was called pretty, that child has brown skin. That child's hair looks like my hair. And it's stuff like that we don't think about, but then, we're middle class kids, the quarantine hit and we can stay in our house if we want to because I'm not an essential worker. I had an income through the end of the school year. So, you know, there, there are all different things to think of. Just speaking to, I did call the 1990s old timey. <laughs> oh, you did. Oh my. I'm older than I look y'all, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> you were born old. <laughs> But um, yeah, that's the kind of stuff. Oh, and I know we're super close. Does anybody have any any questions? Because we, we are just yapping, just yapping away. You know, I saw something today on uh, LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn a lot because I'm a, I'm a businessman, as you can see by my, by my attire. But it was one of four, there's uh, four black <laughs> of the Fortune 500 companies there are four black ceos just four and there used and to this, be one woman and she's gone yeah one black and, woman and th yeah she was at pepsico i believe I she was at xerox she, xerox that's mm -hmm. right so anyway um this guy he's a he's the ceo of tiaa i think it's a financial i don't know his name but he was saying this morning on linkedin that when people, you know, he'll be dressed in a suit and people will, uh, will, will assume that he works, there'll be a reception or something, and they will assume that he works at the reception or he's even been asked to pick up a spoon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is a CEO of a Fortune 500. So, you know, people just don't think. They just don't think. The thing that really bugs me and um, and I have some insight on this that um, that I that I haven't mentioned. Brandy is not the first African American woman I've become close to. My my wife of 20 years is African American, so I've kind of learned along the way, and. You know, when people say that they're colorblind, that is such BS. And it That's, erases, like, I like being black. Don't erase my blackness, yeah. it's cool. When, they, when white people say that they're colorblind, <laughs> we don't, we don't consider, look, don't tell me that. It don't, that's, that's me saying, I don't have eyes in my head, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. Thank you so much, Carmen, sorry, she's leaving. And, oh, I wanted to speak to that, Dean. I didn't find out Dean had a black wife until we had been playing together for like a year. Right. I because didn't... Dean doesn't think he knows because his wife is black. He's just had to have more conversations. He doesn't assume because he's close to someone he knows any more than, than anybody else. So he just like casually mentioned one day that his wife was black. And I was yeah, like, Yeah, I didn't want her purposely to know. Frankly, I didn't want, I didn't want to tell brandy out of the gate hey you know my wife is black I it's thought, a you thing. Know, <laughs> that's i mean how you know that must make me hey I, i'm i'm okay you know yeah, i'm good yeah. so i didn't i didn't tell her for the longest time because i wanted her to accept me for and who all I, of those discussions all those hard talks we had to have he never said i have a black wife so we just had a discussion did. um because it doesn't those, those things don't go together like that. But I do Correct. acknowledge that because his wife is black, 
they've had to have some talks that he might not have had to have otherwise, just by necessity. Not always, but no. um, I recognize in him he's accustomed to hearing from me about certain things. Oh, I'm, I'm accustomed to being told what to do. That's what I'm accustomed to. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you all so much. I, I, I really appreciate um, doing this. I don't want to... I don't know if it'll cut off, so I don't want to talk over the time. <laughs> it won't cut off. <laughs> we, we do have a bit of a schedule. To keep. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I hope this was helpful. Um, and you can you can catch us over at Facebook at um, Pace and Barber. And um, we, we'd love to hear from you. And um, uh, we appreciate your input and your engagement during this. And even the, the questions that were, you know, needed more understanding just to make sure we were being clear in what we were trying to communicate. I want to bill us as the, the finest father and daughter team in old time music. That's it. <laughs> right. Thanks so much, Seth and Joe. Yeah. And Emily. Thank you, Brandy, and thank you, Dean, for this conversation. This is a, a, a continuing and ongoing endeavor. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, the yeah. conversation is not been ended, but it's continued. Um, we have been sponsored by the National Endowment of the Arts, the uh, West Virginia Department of Arts, Culture, and History, the West Virginia Humanities Council, and Davis Hills College. This conversation was also brought to you by you, the registered Augusta uh, participants that support and continue to support uh, our endeavors, um, even as we quickly switched the, into this uh, online uh, format this year. Uh, Emily and I hope that by doing so, we open up a lot of content with a lot more people that may have not have been able to come to this physical programming or um, may be with us from other parts of the world that uh, might not have participated otherwise. Um, this uh, conversation has been recorded. It will be archived in the week two Zoom resources course on the website can be found um, if you click on the curriculum tab underneath the thumbnail it'll be one of the lectures the title will be put that all together thank you very much and we're gonna go ahead and sign off thank you so much Brandy and Dean thank you oh and Seth yeah. it's it's put putting it all together I apologize for my extremely um, strong Georgia draw <laughs> And saying that initially. Okay. <laughs> Putting it all together. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, y'all. Say hi to your family for us. We miss I it. Will. They miss it too. <laughs> bye. Okay, bye. Bye.